Wormwood, it seems to me you take a great many words to tell a very simple story. The long and short of it is that you have let the man slip through your fingers. The situation is very grave, and I see no reason why I should shield you from the consequences of your inefficiency. A repentance and return to what the other side calls grace on the scale which you describe is a great setback. It's basically a second conversion, and an even deeper one, probably. As you ought to have known, the suffocating cloud which prevented your attacking the patient on his walk back from the old mill is a well-known phenomenon. It is one of the enemy's most barbarous weapons. It usually occurs when he is directly present to the patient in modes which are not yet fully classified. Some humans are permanently surrounded by it, and therefore inaccessible to us. And now for your blunders. By your own account, you first of all allowed the patient to read a book which he really enjoyed because he really enjoyed it, and not so that he could make clever remarks about it to his friends. In the second place, you allowed him to walk down to the old mill and enjoy time there, a walk taken through country he really likes and taken alone. In other words, you allowed him two real positive pleasures. Were you so ignorant as to not see the danger of this? The characteristic of pains and pleasures is that they are unmistakably real, and so, as far as they go, give the one who feels them a touchstone of reality. If you were trying to damn your man by the romantic method, submerging him in self-pity for imagined distresses, you would do your best to protect him from any real pain, because you would know that five minutes toothache would unmask your whole strategy and show that the other things were no pain at all. But you were trying to damn your patient by the world, that is by passing off vanity, bustle, irony, and expensive tedium as pleasures. How could you not see that a real pleasure is the last thing you should have let him eat? Did you not foresee that it would kill by contrast all that nonsense which you had been so laboriously teaching him to value? And that the sort of pleasure that the book and the walk gave him was the most dangerous of all? That it would peel off from his sensibility all that kind of crust which you have been forming up there, and that he would feel he was coming home, recovering himself? In order to separate him from the enemy, you first wanted to separate him from himself, and had been making some progress there. Now all that is undone. Of course I know that the enemy also wants to detach people from themselves, but in a different way. Remember always that he really likes the little vermin, and places an absurd value on the distinctness of each and every one of them. Therefore, when he talks about them losing themselves, he means only surrendering the clamor of their own self-will. Once they have surrendered that to him, he really does give them all of their personality back, and boasts, I'm afraid sincerely, that once they are truly his, they will be more themselves than ever. So while he is delighted to see them sacrificing even their innocent wills to his, he hates to see them drifting away from their own nature for any other reason, and we should always encourage them to do so. The deepest likes and impulses of anyone are the raw material, the starting point with which the enemy has furnished them. To get them away from those is always a point gained, even on indifferent matters. To substitute the standards of the world, or fashion, or convention for what a human really likes is always preferable. I myself would carry this very far. I would make it a rule to eradicate from my patient any strong personal preference which is not itself a sin. Even trivial things such as a fondness for sports, or collecting stamps, or drinking hot chocolate. I grant you there are no virtues in these things, but there is a kind of innocence and self-forgetfulness about them which I distrust. The human who truly and disinterestedly enjoys any one thing in the world for its own sake, regardless of what others say, is by that very fact armed against some of our subtlest modes of attack. You should always try to get the patient to abandon the people, food, and books that he really likes in favor of the best people, the right food, and the important books. I have known a human who was defended against a great temptation to social ambition by an even greater taste for sauerkraut. It remains to be seen how we can recover from this disaster. The first thing is to prevent his doing anything. As long as he does not convert it into action, he can think about this new repentance all he wants. Let the little brute wallow in it. If he has any bent that way, let him write a book about it. That is often a good way of sterilizing the seeds which the enemy plants into a human heart. Let him do anything but act. No amount of piety in his imagination or affections can harm us if we keep it out of his will. As one of the humans has said, Active habits are strengthened by repetition, but passive ones are weakened. The more often he feels without acting, the less he will ever be able to act, and, eventually, the less he will ever be able to feel. <laughs> <laughs>